first one is uh, is talent. With no talent, no success. And that's something you cannot learn. You have to born with it. Kids and a lot of tennis fans see, you know, all the glitz and glam, the prize money, the travel that the tennis players doing all over the world, the roar of the crowd. You have to be extremely strong mentally. And then if you couple the fact that you are talented with an enormous ethical of work and hard work with the right entourage around you, then you might have a chance to make it. Fernando Soler is a renowned figure in tennis, having served as senior vice president and managing director at IMG Tennis Worldwide. He played a pivotal role in signing top players like Novak Djokovic and Garbine Muguruza. His expertise and influence have significantly shaped the sport. Soler's passion for tennis and commitment to excellence continue to inspire players and fans around the world. When I was a pro tennis player and I had to deal with all the issues from A to Z, that was at the best school for me, much better than when I was in university. In the United States, the tennis participation has actually exploded. You have to be very strong physically, very strong mentally, and there is only a few. You know, there is only 100, 200 players in the world in each, male and female, that really enjoy being there. The Avenue of the Strongest is a podcast dedicated to exploring the lives and experiences of the most inspiring individuals from around the world. Each episode features interviews with fascinating guests who share their insights and wisdom on a variety of topics, including education, impact, motivation, health, and learning. Here are your hosts, Aniette Chowdhury and Vlad Suleiman. Fernando, your career in tennis has spent both playing and managing the sport. And I would like to start by delving into the beginning of your tennis journey. While growing up in uh, Spain, uh, and the Spain known for country where soccer is the most popular sport, and you chose to pursue tennis. Uh, my question to you is, uh, who influenced you? When did you first pick up your racket? And what sparked your interest in tennis? Well, I... I have the. I was lucky enough that when I was born, my family uh, were members of a tennis club in Barcelona, so they uh, they put me in the in the learning school to 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 play a, a little bit and see if I like it. Obviously, in the school I was playing, as you very rightly said, uh, a lot of football, and uh, I was uh, playing both sports quite intensively. My um, Next uh, brother, we are six siblings, but my, the, I'm, and I'm the sixth one of six. But the, the fifth one also played tennis. He was well ranked on the ATP as well, and um, and he made an influence on me on trying to emulate and and and, and follow his path. Um, I was lucky enough to be quite good in the early days. You know, at the at the age of twelve, I or, already started to win. Uh, tournaments in the region. I pick up my first racket uh, at eight years old, which is very different than today, but that's what it was at the time. Mm -hmm. And right now, I guess everybody's saying if you are picking up at eight years old, it's already late for you, right? If you pick up the racket at eight years old, you'll be a very good <laughs> club player. And what's the best age right now? It's uh, four years old, three years old? Everybody starts to play at four. I think before four makes no sense, but at four year old, you can start already having a feeling on the racket, a feeling on the ball, and a feeling on the distances of the court. And um, uh, that's when people start today. I guess I'm already I'm already late with my kids, with, with one of my kids. I have another shot with my second one. She's four years old right now. Well, it's not <laughs> an easy sport, uh, you know, especially at the beginning. Uh, it's very hard to have fun because yeah. it's very difficult. So you have to put them when they are not very conscious about it, when they are young. So when they are more conscious, they are already enjoying a little bit the game. Mm -hmm. And you were saying that your parents were part of the club. Your parents supported you all the way long? Were they pushing you or it was all by yourself? Uh, they were not pushing me at all. Uh, we're talking about many years ago. Uh, my parents at the time didn't think that becoming a tennis player was the right thing to do. They thought, you know, you should go to university and look for a proper job. 
But since my brother already broke the ice on that and convinced them to allow him to play, when I came, uh, the wall was down already. So it was easier for me to take the decision and, and become a, a professional tennis player. Well, you know, uh, Vlad and uh, Fernando, and what, what a pleasure to get to speak with you. You know, in the United States, the tennis participation has actually exploded. Um, in fact, and I, I was just doing a little prep work here, and it, apparently there's been a 33% increase. Like millions of players have been added in terms of just general interest and hobby uh, since the pandemic. Uh, so the growth is uh, very real in America right now for tennis. It, 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 can you share any insights as to why? What is this sudden uptick in American interest in, in, in playing and learning tennis? Well, I, I actually was not aware of this uh, information and I'm extremely happy to hear that. I think that uh, after the pandemic, uh, all of us are looking for outdoor experiences. All of us have a higher uh, conscious about taking care of our health, uh, both mentally and physically. I think uh, many activities, uh, many outdoor activities are enjoying this. Uh, likewise, life events uh, are having the best attendance they had in, in many years. Um, I believe tennis is, is, uh, is benefiting from this because it's a sport that you can play mm -hmm. all your life. You know, there are many other beautiful sports like, I don't know, American football or even soccer. Uh, others that you can only play, you know, until you are 30, 35, but tennis, you can play until you are 19 year old. You only need another person to be in front of you on a tennis court. It's quite cheap. You know, you only need a racket, pair of shoes and, um, and, and, and you can enjoy, you know, you can play outdoor, you can play indoor, you can play all, all, all year long, uh, regardless where you are based or how the climate is. So I, I believe that's the explanation. Mm. And I want to talk a little bit about uh, tennis and, and, and kids here. So I, I know that tennis is seen, or many people see it as an individual sport. And a lot of parents here try to get their children into team sports because they believe it's crucial for developing teamwork. Why is tennis a great sport for kids to pick up, for young kids to pick up? Well, it is the big debate about what is better for your kids if it's yeah. team sports or individual sports. Um, I think both are excellent. And, and me as a parent, I try for my kids to do both. I think you benefit from uh, both immensely. Team sports, you have the ability to share your moments of glory and moments of pain with the team. And you're bonding with people. You, you learn concepts like friendship, like loyalty, uh, but boy, individual sport is what life is about, right? At the end of the day, uh, you're going to be on your own. Uh, you're going to be able to trust very few people uh, in your business life, in your personal life. You're going to have to take decisions that nobody else can take. And um, an individual sport is going to give you all this. It's going to allow you to manage emotions. It's going to allow you to uh, take decisions. It's going to allow you to enjoy glory and pain. And, and, and you can hide on a team when things go wrong. And it's going to put yeah. you on your spot. So, I, I, you know, you have the risk of becoming a little bit selfish because, again, it's all about you and you forget about the, the team sometimes. But... Uh, mm. I, I, in my opinion, individual sport is, is, is a fantastic thing. I learned everything in my life when I was a pro tennis player and I had to deal with all the issues from A to Z. That was at the best school for me, much better than when I was in university. This podcast is sponsored by Argo Prep, an award-winning educational publisher serving over a million students nationwide. If you're a kindergarten to eighth grade teacher or principal, be sure to check out our supplementary workbooks to get your students ready for standardized state testing. We cover all subjects from kindergarten to eighth grade. Use the coupon code AVENUE for a 25% discount off of all purchase orders. Visit us today at argoprep.com slash store. 
You know, and and uh, speaking of um, the tennis right now becoming more popular and popular, I guess also a lot of kids and a lot of tennis fans see, you know, all the glitz and glam, the prize money, the travel that the tennis players doing all over the world, the roar of the crowd. But, you know, it's like for them, it's like a dream life. They see it, they want it. That's why they, everybody went and ran to the, to the tennis, to the tennis sport. But we all know there is more to the story. Uh, what's the reality of a long, for young players? We all hear about the crazy practice schedules, but was it, it, what is it in reality? Could you please shed the light? What is it like the life of the real tennis player? Well, it's immensely difficult to become a successful professional tennis player. So it's an extremely hard life. You lose your young, your young years. Uh, you have to work very hard at a very early age. You have to give up on many things, sometimes including family, sometimes including school. So what you see at the tournament is just the pinnacle of a very big pyramid at the base. So, uh, you know, it's, again, it's extremely difficult to success. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I will not recommend a parent to try for his kid to become a professional tennis player because you're going to let on the road many things uh, with a very little chance to succeed. I know that's a little bit harsh, but uh, it is the truth. You know, you, you have to practice so many hours. You have to be talented like crazy. You have to be very strong physically, very strong mentally. And there is only a few, you know, there is only 100, 200 players in the world in each uh, male and female that that really enjoy uh, being there. And if, if you imagine the number of people playing and the number of kids trying that, you'll understand that it's extremely low percentage. Yeah. So uh, you, you have to be very conscious about that. I mean, it's nice to play. The sport has so many attributes that your kids can enjoy and learn. You know, it might be helpful in college. It, it will be always helpful to be a healthy person, but forget about professional. That that That's for a very, very, very small amount of people. Mm -hmm. And how many years usually it takes, let's say, for example, uh, the kid starting at four years old, what is it, like 10 years old, they have to grind their way out to the... No, I think, I think, I think that the days you have to start to understand if you have a chance or not are between 12 and 14, you know, but by 12 and 14, you, your body starts to be developed. You know, if you're going to be tall, if you're not going to be tall, you know, your talent, you know, you know, your hands, you know, your physical, you know, your mental. You know, you have already a little bit of a sign on your results, which which are not important. The results are not important uh, at a 12-year-old, certainly are not at all. Uh, not even at 14, not even at 16. But yes, you can, you can, you know, people who are in the industry will tell you if you have a chance or not, uh, if, if they are honest enough. I mean, you, you can tell, you can tell quite quickly that, you're going to have a chance or you, or you won't. You know, your career path in tennis is incredible. You know, you transitioned from the competitive world on the court and entered into the strategic world of managing superstars. I know that you were the managing director at IMG Tennis Worldwide for many, many, many years. So my question to you is, what was the biggest challenges you faced early on making the shift from player to then agent, and what was that like? And then what is the most rewarding aspect of that career? Well, the, the, the biggest challenge, challenge for me at the beginning was to understand the corporate world. You know, I, I, I entered IMG and I never worked before in a big corporation. So, you know, be surrounded by 300 people or know that you are part of 300 people at the time. Um, you know, it, it was a big change. I had to go to London 
um, to you know to be there for nine months, understand the culture mm-hmm. of the company, understand people. That that was very challenging. It actually becoming an agent. Uh, it was not that different from being a tennis player because you are very alone. Mm. You know, you have your clients and you have to do the job. You have to you have to spot the client, you have to sign the client, and you have yeah. to sell the client. And even if you are in a in a big company, um, you know, you have to do the job. You have your P and L, you have your 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 obligation to to deliver. And and you have to look for your product. No no one comes to you and, and asks you to sell Coca Cola. You know, in the in the in the region of <laughs> Barcelona, you have to go and have talent enough to spot a player in your region that you think you can make it. You have to convince him to sign with you, and then you have to get the revenues. So 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 that that was challenging, but it was very rewarding because again, like on the tennis court, you know when you win a match. When you sign the player, you feel, you know, rewarded. And when you sell him, and when you see that your PNL starts to grow, and you're starting to make a career as an agent, and you see your players to succeed and win Grand Slams, and then you know that suddenly your product becomes even better and better and better, and 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 everything escalates. That's very rewarding mm. as an agent. And during your career at uh, IMG. You secured endorsements for some of the biggest names in uh, in the industry, including Novak and uh, Garbin Muguruza. So, Muguruza. Uh, my question is, how is it to work with such high-profile clients, <laughs> taking into account that everyone is possessing their own, you know, personality, ups and downs? I mean, you have to approach everyone differently. So, how 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 is it? It's not easy. Uh, that's why. In, in, in the tennis industry, there is quite a big of a turnover on mm. player changing agents. But when you mention the two specific cases of Novak Djokovic and Garbine Muguruza, at the time I was managing the tennis division for IMG. So I had like more than 10 agents working for me. And it was a phenomenal group where, you know, we had specific agents with each player. We had uh, some uh, sales guys that will help us to sell the players. We had a structure, you know, at the time we were 62 people and I was fortunate to give the ability to sign employees that will help to deliver the job. And and that's why um, we were and, we, and IMG is still the best company for player representation. You know, you've witnessed the careers of many top players. So I want to ask you, what do you consider the top three personality characteristics that contribute to a successful tennis player? Are there any specific uh, mental qualities or character traits that separate champions from all the rest of us? Well, the the, the first one is uh, is talent. With no talent, no success. Uh, and that's something you can you mm. cannot learn. You have to born with it okay and i'm talking both technically and physically you know you can have great hands but bad legs you you won't make it you need to have both so you have to have talent on both sides and then you have to be extremely strong mentally and you know these two things are very important the third thing i will call having the right entourage Mm. around you you know, we've seen many players, you know, with the wrong dad or the wrong coach or the wrong physical trainer. Um, you know, you have to have the best team possible around you, a, a team that is not toxic, a team that is behind you in the good moments and in the bad moments. And you have to be very smart to get surrounded by that by that good team. And you have to take these decisions when you are young. So it's not it's yeah. not easy, you know. Sometimes your pa- your father wants to become the coach, you know, and you have to be smart, and you have to ha- find the right coach and put your father on- your father on the side. You know, there are many, as I was mentioning, there are many decisions you're gonna have to take along the way that are gonna be crucial because you need a lot of stability. You know, you need to work very hard. You you have to work with the best professionals. 
And then if you couple the fact that you are talented with an enormous ethical of work and hard work with the right entourage around you, then you might have a chance to make it. Uh, and that unfortunately is not equally easy in every country. You know, there are players coming from countries who are less developed, uh, they have less structure in tennis, and that makes it even more difficult for them, although make them also very, very angry, very hungry to, to make it, you know. But this, this mm -hmm. will be my answer to your question. What do you think about the story of uh, Richard Williams, known also like King Richard of the Williams? He was pushing their kids like crazy. I think it's fascinating. Is is uh, coming from a very uh, harsh place in in California, with a determination to get uh, his daughters uh, tennis players. His confidence in them, his attitude. Uh, I mean, it, it, it is unique in the in the history of tennis, right? That. Uh, a father made a, such a big contribution, um, but then he also learned to to step aside. As I was mentioning, <clears throat> both Venus and, and Serena had their own coaches and their own agents, and um, and that helped for the success both on the court and off the court of both of them, which is huge. Yeah, this this story was. I mean, this is crazy. I don't know if everybody who's listening to us right now know it. He has nine children and he was pushing all of them towards tennis and only two became professional tennis players, correct? Yeah, he was pushing Venus and Serena to, to become tennis players. Uh, I'm sure he had a good eye to do that because he saw talent uh, in both of them, okay? Uh, you know, physically and technically, they are both amazing and mentally as you can tell as well. So he probably had the eye as father that uh, and the knowledge that made him believe that with with a lot of work behind them and the right entourage, they could make it. So Fernanda, uh, I have a question which I cannot not ask you about the big three. <laughs> so their era cast a long shadow, but new players are emerging. With your experience in both playing and managing talent, what do you see the next generation star with the potential to break uh, to break through the challenge of dominance of uh, Djokovic, Nadal, and Federer? Well, I mean, what we've seen with Djokovic, Nadal, and Federer is unbelievable. I mean, I don't think we will ever see this again. I don't think so. Having said that, uh, the players that are coming up now to me, are extraordinary. Uh, Alcaraz, Sinner, um, you know, Medvedev, uh, Zebrev, um, you know, uh, Ruth, Rune. They are very, very, very talented players. And, and they show that on the court, especially Alcaraz, Sinner and Medvedev already won Grand Slams. Mm. Alcaraz, at the age of 21, has won three different Grand Slams. So I, I believe that that number is as good as the other three uh, did at that age. Certainly, Novak, I don't think he won three slams at the age of 21. But Alcaraz won three different ones. So so that's unbelievable. That's That is what always happens in tennis. I mean, you always think that the generation has been so good that now the sport is going to go down and never happens. You know, I remember very well the Borg, Lendl, Connors, McEnroe era. You know, everybody thought, oh my God, what's going to happen now? And then the Agassi came, Sampras came, Courier came, Stefan Edberg, Boris Becker. It was an amazing roster of players. And then when they started to you know, to retire, I remember Sampras losing to Federer on center court in Wimbledon, and everybody was thinking, oh, what's going to happen now? And then these three came, you know, Jogovic, Nadal, and, and Federer, who made such an impact on the history of tennis that, you know, it's going to be very difficult to for anyone to get even close to it. But, you know, one kid at 20, 21 year old already has won three. 
if you think that these guys, the big three, are playing at the age of 35, I mean, how many slams Alcaraz mm -hmm. can win if 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 he has no injuries and he keeps working hard and so and so? So that's the beauty of the sport. Who do, uh, in your experience, I mean, uh, was the hardest player to work with? Uh, I think it's difficult to to name one, but uh, what I'll tell you is that the better the player is on the court, the harder the job is. You know, because there is more pressure to deliver and uh, the player himself is suffering a lot of pressure on court. You know, media is putting pressure, everybody, entourage is putting pressure, himself is putting pressure. So once a player reaches the top 10, the game changes and, and you know, you need to know that as an agent. Uh, sometimes the domestic market of a player is very favorable. Sometimes it's very hard. You know, it's not the same to find endorsement for a player in the U.S. that a player in Croatia, you know, or in Uruguay, you know, because the domestic market is not as strong. So, you know, all these things need to be taken into account. Fernando, I want to speak about, I know we were speaking about generations uh, and new players coming in as the generations pass. We were speaking about the term generations, but uh, a lot of the, uh, because you were on the managing side for many, many years and you still are, uh, I want to speak about the younger generation's attention span. And I know we have a lot of talk about that the younger generation now has a shorter attention span or their preferred content delivery is quick, highlights, reels, what the players are saying, and so on and so forth, as opposed to watching three, four, five, six hours of televised content. Are there, be, are there things being done or in the discussion to appeal to the new, uh, to the new uh, 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 younger generation? Because ultimately they will grow up. So is there anything being done? And is there a change in content delivery in the future in your uh, in your in your expertise, it, it is happening. I mean, the, the industry is 100% conscious about this issue. And, uh, you know, for example, ATP Media, who makes the production for all the ATP Master Series, you know, they produce so much additional content to the live tennis match for consumption of any kind of duration. <laughs> I mean, you can have the highlights, you can have pictures of, uh, of the site of the tournament, of the locker room, uh, you know, what the player, uh, when the player arrives to the tournament with the transportation. So there is a constant desire when the player is practicing. <clears throat> there is a constant desire to, to produce content, additional content to the live transmission that can be put for a streaming so can um, fulfill the appetite of any kid that, as you very rightly said, uh, don't have the, pi the patience of the, or, or, or the time to be three hours in front of the television to, to uh, watch an entire tennis match. Yeah, great, great insight. Now, Fernando, we only have two questions left for you. And uh, we have a segment. The last two questions are always a question from the previous guest. And so this question is coming from a previous guest. And uh, and so I'll give you the two ways to answer this question. So the question is, what is the most important thing for you to change as soon as possible in order to live the life that you want? Or the other way to think about that is, are you happy right now in life? And if not, what needs to change so you can be happy? Well, that's not a tennis related question. It's not. <laughs> <clears throat> well, you know, you cannot never be completely happy about your life, right? I mean, you're going to be happy a few days and you're going to be less happy uh, other days, you know? So I think for me to answer this question, what I will say is that I'm enjoying a lot my uh, new life as a sport consultant since I started at the end of 2018. And uh, what I would like is to keep doing it, uh, you know, for, for, a, for a few more years. I mean, I really enjoy it gives me the balance uh, to have a personal life and a professional life. It uh, gives me a chance to spend time with my family and still enjoy the sport and the industry. So I would really like to uh, enjoy that, uh, that the stays as it is or, or improves with more 
challenging projects that I can contribute even to my experience. I love that answer. And Fernando, uh, you know, uh, uh, you're in Spain, you, you're, you live in Barcelona. Uh, do people in Barcelona think that Americans are crazy because they don't have siesta time? Because when I went to uh, Spain, it was so beautiful. And afternoon, early afternoon, all shops were closed. Because Americans just running for the work and they don't enjoy the life. Well, well, this this topic of the siesta is gone more than thirty years ago. You know, not not nobody does siesta in Spain anymore. I mean, maybe the retired people or the old mm. people, but but this is something is gone. So, you know, for good or bad, we we started to mirror what what you guys do in, in at, at at many levels. Um, yes, I think that is still the 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 the, the notion that Americans. Um, focus their life too much around work and don't have a personal life and that we care more about families than what you do and and moving less as, uh, compared to what you do. But, you know, I think that uh, we are closer and similar than we were years ago. Mm. And uh, for good or bad, uh, I think we have no other option to but to be close to what what you are moving forward. Fernando, what an absolute pleasure. Uh, my last question to you. What question would you like us to ask our next guest? Any question of your choice. I think I will ask, what is he doing uh, to make the world a better world for the next generations? Mm. I love that question. Fernando, it has been an absolute pleasure. Uh, thank you for taking the time to spend uh, uh, talking with us today. And please... Uh, Please uh, continue to do what you're doing. You've, uh, you're incredible. Thank you so much for your time. Thank, thanks for your time. Enjoy.